Okay, thanks for being here. This is my first time doing a video like this where I'm sitting and talking in front of the camera, so it's a new direction for me, but I think it's gonna be good because it's still a way for me to express myself and explore things that interest me and be able to put it out there and maybe have a conversation about it. So yeah, I think it's gonna be really good um, and we'll see where it takes us, but for now it's just a casual thing. So this video and the direction I'm going to be taking this channel in is going to be largely centered in the true crime genre. And there's a lot of YouTubers out there right now who are making really great true crime content that's um, informative and awesome like deep dives and it's respectful to the victims' families and to the victims themselves, which is really important because I feel like there's a lot of other true crime content out there that is just tacky and it's centered around entertainment value and it's disrespectful in a lot of ways and that saddens me because the true crime genre has so much potential it can do so much good when we can learn something from the cases that we talk about and that we analyze and we can like implement into our own lives and into our own actions I think that is awesome and that's one of the reasons why I love the true crime genre it it makes me you know reflect on my own life and reflect on my own actions and think you know how can I do better and so I guess I want to share that here on this platform. I want to bring awareness to certain cases that have stayed with me and had an impact on my life. Um, I think that it's worth looking into, it's worth talking about, um, just to help people be more aware and hopefully make a difference and prevent stuff like this from happening in the future because a lot of the systems, you know, whether it's, you know, like systems like services like CPS or the justice system you know they're broken in this country and they're not gonna get fixed if we don't at least start talking about it and analyzing some of these areas where things went wrong things ended in terrible tragedy and trying to pinpoint you know areas where we can do better I think that's going to help push us in the direction of progress and I think about this stuff a lot it's very prevalent in my life I consume a lot of true crime content. I think about it a lot. So I think that this is a good jumping off point for me to um, sort of organize my thoughts a little bit, help myself work through some of these things, and hopefully share it with some other people that are interested in it too because um, I don't have a lot of people in my like day-to-day -day life, day-to-day -day interactions that want to talk about murder cases. You know, true crime and generational abuse and dysfunction and trauma those are not just taboo topics here on youtube but in the real world so it needs to be talked about we need to get to the bottom of these things and be more aware of them because when we're young we're vulnerable and we don't always have the best idea of what's right what's wrong what's normal what's acceptable and what boundaries like should look like so I think a lot of the stories in the true crime genre are really great examples of why boundaries are important why we need to talk about generational abuse and trauma and how to you know prevent these things in the future how to recognize red flags and what you know the next actions are gonna be so that's where I want to focus this channel mostly on and today I want to talk about the Josh Powell case and this is an older case. Um, it started back in 2009 and there's just so much information to unpack on this case. There's a lot of great YouTube creators right now who are going through the timeline of the case. But in this video, I'm going to be talking more about um, Josh's family history, some behavioral patterns displayed by all of his family members and you know, things that were overlooked and Josh Powell's childhood, um, stuff about his father. And I, I really want to start a conversation about, you know, generational abuse and how it can escalate. And I think that will help us uncover some, you know, cycles of abuse and generational trauma. And that's always, I guess, what's really interested me about this case. So I really want to focus on those details. It's the family dynamic and dysfunction that helped lead to what happened. and everything that happened before the crime, um, you know, the behavioral patterns that Josh displayed. Then his father was even later convicted for voyeurism because he was like filming his neighbors, you know, into their bathroom, like through their blinds and stuff. And it's just a really disturbing case. So I guess like those having multiple components to it, you know, it, it sets it apart from other 
you know, murder investigations and other cases that we've heard about. Um, and there's just really a lot to unpack, I think a lot to learn and a lot to like move forward with. So, so if you want a really in-depth, like deep dive narrative account of what happened, you should look up the cold podcast because that's a great podcast. There's like 17 hours, 20 hours of content. Some of the stuff that I'm going to be talking about in this video, like uh, analyzing, I got from episodes of the cold podcast just because he provides so much great material. Um, it's really awesome. And then Jennifer Graves also has a book. Um, she came out with a book called A Light in Dark Places and that's also a really good source of information that I use in this video. So just in case you're unfamiliar with the case, I'm going to give you a short rundown of exactly what happened. So Josh Powell and Susan Cox got married in 2001 and they were married in the LDS Church, which is the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, um, otherwise known as Mormons. So in the earlier part of their marriage, they lived with Josh's dad, Steve, and Michael and Alina, Josh's siblings, were also living in the house at the time, so there wasn't a lot of privacy. And during this time, Josh's dad developed a sick obsession with Susan. And Susan was naive at first to Steve's crush, but Steve really gave her the creeps. Um, you know, she kind of started to suspect that something was off. Like one time she was in the bathroom and she thought that she saw like a mirror slide under the door, like somebody was spying on her. And she just felt like it was it was a really uncomfortable situation. And even at one point, um, you know, Josh was changing careers and they were getting ready to eventually move out of Steve's house. Um, but Josh was becoming a truck driver and so he was going to leave for a while and rather than Susan staying with the Powell family without Josh, she was going to go visit her parents for a little while and Steve offered to drive her and on this drive Steve confessed his love to her and basically talked about how like every little thing that she did was like a sign that she was interested too and he needed to know if she really was. And she, in no uncertain terms, told him, like, you are my father-in-law, I'm your daughter-in-law, that's the extent of our relationship, you should look at me as family. Steve still didn't get the picture after this, but, you know, Susan had talked to Josh about it, and um, it affected Josh a little bit at first, I think, but Steve eventually was able to convince Josh that Susan was the one in the wrong and that Susan had instigated it. And this was really the start of a lot of the dysfunction in the relationship. And there was a lot of financial issues. In 2005, they had their first son, Charlie. And then in 2007, they had another boy, Brayden. At this point in their lives, Josh and Susan were living in Utah. And the only family that they had nearby was Josh's mother, Terry, and his older sister, Jennifer. Josh became very controlling um, over not just the finances, but like Susan's freedoms and the car. And even though they were married in the LDS church, Josh really fell away from his religion and would even make fun of Susan for wanting to pay tithing, which is kind of like offering to your church. But a lot of the reasons why Susan had fallen for him in the first place were really starting to become non-existent in Josh. Um, he was very closed off and he wouldn't give her a lot of attention. He didn't want to kiss her or be intimate with her. So the marriage was anything but smooth sailing and the tension definitely kept building, but they were married for about eight years. And this brings us to December 6th, 2009, which is the last day that Susan was ever seen by her friends or family. December 6th, 2009, it was a Sunday and that day was Pretty normal by most accounts. Susan and the boys attended church. Josh made them pancakes when they got back. Um, one of Susan's neighbor friends, who was also a member of the church, came over for a little while. Um, Josh's actions from basically this point on just get super weird. On Sunday night, after Susan had gone to bed, he decided that he was gonna take the boys on a midnight camping trip. So they live in West Valley, Utah, um, near the West Desert. So it's pretty cold. Um, I can't remember exactly how cold, but like below freezing temperatures. And he just decides to pack up his four-year-old and his two-year-old to go on a midnight camping trip on a Sunday night when he has to work in the morning on Monday. But he claims that he forgot that it was Sunday and that he just packed the boys up on this camping trip. They had enough supplies and like heaters and a tent to keep them warm and that Susan was okay with it. Which it seems really odd just because I don't, I'm not a mother, but I don't know, I, I, I don't think I would want 
them driving in the middle of a snowstorm into the desert to go camping when it's already like midnight like how the boys are gonna not even be awake for much of it but I don't know that was his story and initially the entire family was reported missing because on the morning of December 7th Josh didn't show up for work and neither did Susan and the boys weren't dropped off at daycare so immediately this kind of caused some panic in the community from people who were expecting them and so people were trying to get a hold of Josh and Susan they started to contact um, Josh and Susan's emergency contacts which happened to be um, Jennifer Graves which was um, Josh's sister so since Jennifer and Josh's mom Terry were the only family that they had down there, they drove down to their house to kind of see what was up and see what they could do to help. The initial worry was that there might be a carbon monoxide leak, so when Jennifer and Terry got to the house, um, they saw like the blinds kind of like moving, like they there was air flowing, so they thought, oh, this is further evidence, you know, that there could be a gas leak or something. So. They ended up calling the police just to do um, like a welfare check, you know, to see what was going on. Everybody was really worried. And, you know, they told them we can't find Josh or Susan. The boys haven't showed up. We can't get a hold of them. There's no footprints in the snow. So it seems like they're all still in the house. Um, and meanwhile, they're still all trying to get a hold of Josh. And the community is kind of like scrambling all together to try to figure out where this family is. So the police arrive and they broke a window on scene. They got permission from Terry to enter the house and the family wasn't there and and there were two box fans that were like pointed you know in a 90 degree angle from each other at a spot on the couch um, or like the floor you couldn't really tell like what it is but they were definitely pointing at the same spot to like dry it and that's why the blinds had been seen fluttering so um, the home tested negative for carbon monoxide and there was nobody in sight. Susan's purse was still there, um, her credit card and ID and everything was there, but the family's uh, minivan was gone. So the police were asking, are you sure that Susan and the boys and Josh didn't go up to visit other family members in Washington? Because they had, you know, family up there, but, you know, they hadn't said anything to anyone about that. Um, Meanwhile, it's like early afternoon, one of the neighbors actually got a hold of Josh and Josh answers the phone, he picks up and he says he's out south with the boys and that they had gone on a camping trip but that he's like on his way back. And this is like the first of the suspicious behavior. I mean, as if a family of four going missing on a Monday morning isn't suspicious enough, but Josh ends up returning home around five o'clock with the boys but not with Susan. and. He claims that on Sunday night, after Susan had gone to bed, he just decides to pack up his four-year-old and his two-year-old to go on a midnight camping trip on a Sunday night when he has to work in the morning on Monday. But he claims that he forgot that it was Sunday and that he just packed the boys up on this camping trip. Nobody really seemed to buy it. The police were suspicious from the get-go. Um, Jennifer Graves, Josh's older sister, recalls being skeptical from like the first minute. Like sh she had a thought, you know, what did he do to her? And it was just so strange that the whole family was missing at first and then everybody comes back except for Susan. So the family only had one minivan too and Josh had taken it so how would Susan have gotten to work? Susan's family by now has been contacted and people are pretty worried. Some of Susan's neighbors and people that she'd gone to church with um, knew that she had been having some troubles in her marriage with Josh and they expressed this to police. But so the police also are starting to think that this is pretty suspicious. You know, they've still got a missing woman that they have to find. Everyone's worried about Susan. So the police begin an investigation. They had Josh come in the next morning for questioning and because, you know, when somebody's wife's missing, people always look at the people who are closest to them. And usually this is like a spouse or a partner, a romantic partner or an ex-partner. and. Josh had suspicion written all over him. The odds of Susan being able to like pick up and go and not leave a trace behind are pretty low. She didn't take any of your, her credit cards or cash with her. All of her friends and family said that she would never leave her boys. And as hard as things had gotten in her marriage, um, Susan expressed through her own writings, you know, in her diary that she was committed to this marriage, that she felt that she had made a vow, you know, before God and before Josh and her family and his family, and that she 
wanted things to get better so people couldn't see her just like upping and leaving and meanwhile Josh is super suspicious so pretty much throughout every police interrogation with him his answers they don't tell you anything you know he always says like I don't know or ends up talking in circles in a way where he doesn't give them any information or really answer the question at all and um, there was just a lot of complication with questioning him because you know, he would say he wanted a lawyer, but then he would keep talking and then he would get distracted if his sons were in the room. They didn't arrest him right away, which is disappointing. And that's part of why this case gets so frustrating because he just always found a way to like evade their questioning. And Josh was also really smart too. And like, even though the police got a warrant for his car and his cell phone, you know, he um, took the SIM card out of his phone before they could take it. And like back then, that's where all the information was. So. Josh was pretty smart, so he had covered his tracks. He knew how to evade police and evade detection, you know. Um, it's creepy because Susan wrote in her journal one time about how Josh was getting really into like true crime and murder mysteries, and one time they had friends over and they there was like a news broadcast on or like some dateline thing and Josh had turned to their friends and was like, I mean, if that was me, I could have gotten away with it. All, all the guy has to do is make sure that they never find a body. And if you don't have a body, you don't have a crime. And Susan later on to her friend was like, you see what I'm talking about? Do you see what I have to deal with here? And I mean, that's just another, we're gonna, like I said, get into a lot of these weird red flags. But, you know, when he said that whole no body, no crime thing, that's just like really telling because Susan's never been found and he seemed to have a really good idea about how police investigations worked, about um, what they were going to do throughout the course of investigation, and he just managed to stay one step ahead of them. And so during the investigation, Josh went to go live in Washington with his dad. His brother Michael and his sister Alina were also living with Steve at the time. And being close with his family during this time really helped Josh continue to dodge getting arrested. And the Powells were smart. Michael, his brother, had a degree in cognitive science, and um, it's often suspected that he helped Josh conceal Susan's body. Um, Steve himself, Josh's father, was very sneaky. He had methods of, you know, voyeurism and stalking and documentation that would give Josh a run for his money and like I said we're gonna talk all about that a little bit further. Um, police were really set on having a body and they were searching the West Desert and you know they got warrants for Josh's phone, his car, their home, um, but they didn't feel like they had enough to arrest him which is debatable but basically Josh was able to avoid getting arrested for so long. And Susan's parents, uh, the Cox family, um, were actively trying to get custody of Charlie and Brayden at this time and they ended up being successful in 2012. And Josh was allowed to have um, supervised visits with the kids. A lot of the reasons why he lost custody of the kids had to do with him living with his dad Steve because a lot during the investigation a lot was uncovered about Steve that they weren't even initially looking for. They just kind of unearthed this like gold mine of like illegal voyeuristic footage that was also evidence in the case um, but there was also child pornography images that were found on Josh's computer when they looked at the hard drives there was just some like questionable actions happening too um, in between like 2009 and 2012 during the investigation when Josh was like with his sons and like they would say that like he was sleeping in bed with them and like having them sleep naked and it's like that is like even if he's not doing anything bad to those kids that is still a boundary that shouldn't be crossed like it, he shouldn't he as a grown man when his kids are getting to like school age and stuff like you shouldn't be sleeping naked with them all in the same bed it's just that you need to start establishing those boundaries and i don't like it i don't think it's okay so and but yeah so he ended up losing custody during this investigation and yet he still wasn't being arrested for susan's murder and he was having supervised visits with the kids and during one of these supervised visits in 2012 uh he managed to 
get the boys into the house and lock the social worker out, the social worker who was there to supervise the visit. Um, and during the time that the social worker was locked out and Josh had these kids alone, he murdered them and murdered himself and set the whole house on fire. So Josh Powell is one of the most probably like notorious family annihilators that we've heard about in modern day. It's just like a spine chilling case. To think that somebody who is, you know, suspected of killing their wife and under investigation for that can get away with it for nearly three years and still be in close enough contact with his, you know, children that he had enough access to and, and their lives as well and his own. So it's just so unfortunate to see how all of it turned out, how it escalated. It just is sickening. And that's one of the reasons why it stayed with me for so long because first off, you have a case of a family annihilator. Like murder already is something very hard to wrap your head around. And then to think about somebody who could kill not just his wife, but also his two young children is something so um, unimaginable to me. I guess that's one of the reasons why it's really stuck with me and why I'm interested in it. Like I, I want to have, I want to know why this happened. Why did this happen? How did this happen? And so that already like is one level of interest I've had in the case. But and but then you've got this other level where it's the entire family history and family dynamic that is just so appalling and so dysfunctional and disturbing with all of the um, evidence that was uncovered during the investigation we have a lot to analyze to help us put together a better picture of what happened and what Josh did in between 2009 and 2012 is a lot to take in but there is so much that happened way before 2009 some of the um, accounts you know that Jennifer Graves provides in her book and other family members and um, the, the things that Susan and Josh and Steve documented really give us a unique um, insight into what their lives were like, what these family dynamics were like, and how things led to this boiling point. So that's where we're going to start here. Now that you guys have an idea of what happened, this married couple um, ends in a family annihilation and we're gonna get really into some of the details. So we're gonna start start really getting deep in and talking about some of the early things that happened in Josh Powell's family before he even met Susan. You know, that helped shape the person that Josh would become. Josh was exposed to a lot of stuff as a kid. But right now we know the end point. We know what happened with Susan and Josh and Charlie and Brayden and the horrible tragedy that the story ended in. But I want to go back, back to before Josh and Susan even knew each other, back to Josh's childhood and even beyond that because Steve's, Steve Powell's childhood is pretty interesting too. So let's go back to Josh Powell's childhood. It was not an ideal childhood to say the least. So Josh was born to Terry and Steve Powell, and he was one of five kids. He had an older sister, Jennifer, and then Josh was the second oldest. He had a younger brother, John, and then Michael, and then a little sister, Alina. And they were all a part of the Church of the Latter-day Saints, so they were all Mormons. But Steve secretly, in Josh's childhood, you know, he was keeping journals about how he actually hated Mormons and he didn't consider himself to be a Mormon and he despised Mormons, basically. He was writing about some really disturbing stuff, you know, beyond just hating um, his family's religion. He was also writing stuff about how he fantasized about taking in another wife, specifically the wife of a man that he and Terry knew. So um, Terry actually ended up finding these journals and it was one of the reasons why she ended up filing for divorce. And I think she found the journals when she was like eight months pregnant with Alina. So can you even imagine? Um, she just uncovered that Steve was really sick. You know, he had a lot of disturbing fantasies and some of the stuff that he would say about Mormons, you know, it got really violent and disturbing. And so Terry had decided that she needed to divorce him because he was going down a path that she didn't agree with and she didn't want her kids to be taken down that path too. 
she could already see it kind of happening because, you know, Jennifer, the oldest child, um, Steve was very inappropriate with her and um, he wrote in these journals that he had about being attracted to Jennifer as a teenager. He would write about how if she was coming down for breakfast like in a t-shirt and underwear that it would drive him crazy and it's just disgusting because that's your own daughter dude and if you're having those types of thoughts you need to seek help you need to talk to somebody about it and she also there's also reports that Steve showed um, Michael and Josh pornography when they were kids so it's just really disturbing and Terry Josh's mom wanted no part of this anymore so she filed for divorce and this led to a really ugly custody battle that you know just brought out more of Steve's true colors and Steve could be really manipulative with his children um, he tried to turn them against their mother and he used examples like mandatory church attendance like as a reasoning for why Terry was evil and he really pitted them against their mother especially in the custody battle he had gotten them to sign like um, you know statements against Terry saying that you know she was controlling and like a Jesus freak and stuff and he would tell the kids that it was Terry that was keeping them apart you know instead of the courts and it was just really unfair treatment and during the divorce Terry said that when she found the journal entries that Steve was writing about this guy's wife that he was like obsessed over and that he wanted to make his second wife she was afraid that like he would really go to the lengths to make this fantasy a reality and, and maybe kill that woman's husband or something like just to really get what he wanted and I mean especially if, if he's showing porn and stuff to his young children I mean that is a that's something that should never ever happen. I would be worried too, like scared for my children's safety. And Steve would do this thing where like he would show up at school and like take the kids out or pick them up early or you know, take them out to lunch or something and when he wasn't supposed to. And this would scare Terry, I mean obviously because Terry knew about the generational abuse and stuff that had happened in Steve's family and in Steve's childhood and this is where a lot of like the generational dysfunction and stuff I think comes into play in this story and just how it escalates through each generation of the family. Steve had a really like rocky childhood as well, really dysfunctional and he basically like replayed that, reenacted that onto his own children. Steve's own parents were divorced and when they were getting a divorce, they would play this game where they would like see how long they could keep the kids until like the courts or whoever made them return them, I guess, and like split the custody, but it was just really messy. They would, you know, do horrible things to each other and it they really like involved the kids and got them in the middle of it and they would like kidnap the kids basically because they would refuse to like share custody you know and there's just no way that that's not going to be traumatic on children and so if that's happening you know in Steve's childhood um, Steve is like almost amplifying it like replaying it but like on an escalated level now with his kids when he and Terry are getting divorced so he's not just keeping the kids from the mom and keeping them past the time and doing that like little back and forth game where I'm like withholding the kids you know he's also crossing other lines and be trying to like instill in them that their mom is evil and that the church is evil and like allowing weird sexual boundaries to be blurred and crossed and I think you know it escalated with Steve and then it escalated with Josh once Josh had kids uh, so it's it's really disturbing and so Terry had reason to be you know fearful in this divorce for her children and um, Terry did get custody of them you know while they were all still underage but he would fail paying child support and was just you know didn't really have the kids best interests in mind but was manipulative enough towards children you know that he was able to get them to think that he was the fun parent or that he was the more lenient one so he did kind of like lure the kids back with him every once in a while you know Alina and Michael did decide to live with Steve once they were older and so did Josh but Jennifer was really the only one that had 
you know, a good head on her shoulders and a clear, you know, perspective about what was really going on with Steve and how manipulative he was. So it, it's just, it's sad to see that, you know, the other four kids really kind of followed in Steve's footsteps more so. After his parents' really messy divorce and the custody battle that followed, Josh was really looking for a sense of stability in his life. Um, he went back and forth between living with his dad and living with his mom, and he found that his dad offered less structure and less rules than his mom did because his mom remained in the Mormon faith and she, you know, wanted him to follow a curfew and refrain from swearing and drinking and stuff like that, which Josh wasn't a big drinker, but just the rules in general were off-putting to him. He didn't want to have to surrender to anybody else's rules but his own just like his father. So this would drive Josh back to Steve's house a lot, like over and over again. And even though Steve like always like let Josh back in, it was always like very um, conditional, you know? Like Josh didn't really get unconditional love from Steve at all. Um, Steve would chastise Josh, you know, when Josh would sympathize with Mormon beliefs or if Josh would talk about wanting to go out and do something on his own and have aspirations, you know, of any sort, and Steve would put him down. Um, Josh talks in some of his journal entries from this time from like around high school that he and his brother Michael had decided that Steve Powell probably resented Josh. Um, and it, it seems kind of like they might have been right because I think Steve probably resented that Josh was like a little bit younger and had his future ahead of him. Um, and with a lot of this family turmoil, Josh started to exhibit some behavioral issues. Um, he, there's like accounts of him killing his sister's gerbils and making her touch its blood. And there's like another account that Josh and his brother Michael actually examined their little sister Alina while she was naked and another account of Josh even threatening his mother with a butcher's knife. So clearly all of the stuff that was happening with his family really affected Josh. And in this time, like late middle school, early high school, he started to get in the habit of documenting his thoughts. You know, he kept journals and um, voice diaries, video diaries, and it's kind of interesting that he chose to do this, I think, because his dad did this too. You know, he, he was keeping journals um, about his deepest, darkest thought. At this point, Josh would have known that Steve kept a lot of journals. He might have seen them around the house or seen Steve writing in them at times. But the lengths that they both went to to document their fantasies and obsessions and thoughts, it's really astounding to me how like parallel they are. And I wonder if they knew the extent of the other's documentation. So. We would later find out that Steve Powell, you know, kept toenail clippings and panties that he stole from Susan's laundry, like personal items that he had no business being in possession of. And he would keep video diaries of himself, like just doing disgusting things. Um, he was very voyeuristic and ended up getting convicted for it and just documented a lot of himself through video and writing and Josh did that too. He had extensive hard drives and, you know, computer memory full of everything from voicemails from like when he was in high school and all of his journals and stuff to stuff like that happened right before the murders. And it's, it's just really interesting that they both did that. So Josh, we know a lot about Josh's early years in high school and the stuff, these patterns that he displayed with women because he documented a lot of his life. And he kept letters from, um, you know, correspondences that he had with crushes and girls that he was interested in. Um, it, it's a really great source of like, this like well of knowledge for us to learn more about him and kind of uncover these patterns that you know, are real real red flags when it's in a domestic relationship and these behaviors come because it's, it's really controlling. And I think that, you know, the level that he and Steve both documented stuff, and even his brother Michael documented a lot of stuff too. It's, it's interesting, but to the level like at which that they did it, it really goes to show how important the need for control is in each of their lives, you know? And the documentation and all of that is just 
one example of that control and how they exert it, but it really is, I think, all comes down to the control that they need to have. And this started a lot like back when Josh was in high school, you know, and after his parents' divorce, I think he needed a way to express himself and organize his thoughts and like just get them out. And that's how, maybe how it started. But some of the earliest recordings that we have and the earliest documentation that Josh kept goes back to high school. So before he had even met Susan, and he talks about how his relationships um, in his family were tough and they were strained and he would write letters to girls. In a lot of these letters he would write about his parents' divorce and that it was a traumatic experience for him and, um, and it really was. I think that seeing what his parents went through, never really having a solid ground with the custody battle and just him living back and forth and having a lot of emotional disturbances, it really inspired a want in Josh to have true love and he really romanticized the idea of true love and relationships, thinking that if you have one person with you, you know, all of your problems will be solved. This is also where he starts displaying that he, just like his father Steve, is not very good with boundaries. So when he was in high school, he really liked this girl who was a couple of years older than him and she wasn't really interested in him beyond just being friends and she made this known. But even though she told him that she wasn't interested in like a boyfriend, he kissed her anyways one time and was like disappointed that she didn't want to kiss him back and didn't want it to happen again. Even though she had already stated like, look, I, I don't think of you that way. I don't want to be anything more than friends. So he had a hard time coping with that and like really letting that sink in, I guess. he did, Even though those boundaries were laid out for him, he didn't want to follow them. And that reminds me a lot of what his father was like. And this girl eventually went off to college and Josh, took out some of his anger on her later on in a letter where he was basically like, you talk down to me, you don't like me, you just want me to be like a puppy that follows you around. Um, and so it kind of just goes to show like how he can be so hot and cold. Like, even though this girl had established the extent of their relationship multiple times, he constantly wanted more from her. And when she wouldn't give him more, he lashed out on her and freaked out and basically told her that she was stuck up and rude, which she didn't deserve because she was just being honest with him. Um, but this really just is like the start of this pattern that Josh displays in a lot of his relationships. So. Just like his father, he is not good with boundaries, but Josh eventually fell out of touch with this girl, but it's kind of weird to me because even after he was so rude to her and overstepped these boundaries, he kept letters that he wrote, you know, to her younger sister. And this is a pattern that Josh like starts to display in his dating life like consistently. Like if he's unsuccessful with one girl and they have a younger sister, he's gonna try to get with that younger sister. Um, the Cold Podcast brings up another example where Josh was interested in this girl and, and he went out of his way to um, like insert himself into her life. Like he tried to learn the language that her family spoke and would show up at their house like around dinner time, you know, to like purposefully insert himself into their lives. And, you know, when he'd be over there, he'd be talking with her for hours and hours and hours and like keeping her out, like just on her front lawn or like outside her door, but like past her curfew, which her parents were really annoyed about. And she was annoyed too, because he was really hard to like slip away from. He was very, you know, kind of aggressive with the way that he took over conversations and and so this girl, just like the other one, you know, expressed to him in no uncertain terms that she wasn't interested in a relationship and that they could be friends as long as, you know, they established some boundaries. Like if he was gonna come over, he had to call first and make sure that it was okay. But um, we're gonna see here that Josh again has like a really hard time with this girl setting boundaries like he can't respect it or he can't wrap his head around it he wrote in one like journal entry that he was unfamiliar with like the concept of curfews and boundaries like that because 
you know, those were things that his mom tried to instill in him in his life, but when she did try to, you know, put in those ground rules and stuff, that's when he ran off to go live with Steve, and Steve never really provided much structure or, like, rules over them, um, especially not a curfew. So. Um, Josh didn't really respect the boundary that this girl was trying to put in place and he would like call and then show up at her house like 20 minutes later and you know that's still kind of like weaseling his way around you know what she exactly what she asked him not to do which is like show up unannounced in a way that doesn't really give her an option to say no you know because he's like already there. This is another example of Josh just like having really poor commitment to boundaries and like poor self-control honestly and I just don't really think that Josh had a clear perception of how he like came across to people especially girls because he would really insert himself into people's lives and expect a lot in return and when people would kind of establish you know that they were uncomfortable or that they needed him to respect certain boundaries um he's he still wasn't really okay with that and he could never commit to that so it was really weird for this girl because once she had told him you know like this still isn't working out because you still keep showing up at my house and making me feel uncomfortable and i'm not interested at all he like couldn't take the hint still and then he like transferred his affections to her little sister you know and started pursuing her and talking to her and this was like a little bit later but you know the little sister ended up telling her older sister you know that josh and her were talking and her sister warned her and was like yo this is not a cool guy he you know has some issues he doesn't respect people's privacy or their space or whatever and Josh was really upset, you know, when the word got back to him because he, again, didn't have really a clear perception of how he was coming across to people, you know. But as Josh was getting older and he was starting college classes and stuff, um, that longing for unconditional love was, it was growing really strong. In Josh's writings, he expressed like how badly he really wanted a girlfriend and a relationship and that he was confused about why women didn't like him. He even talked about how he felt like he deserved a girlfriend, you know, which really reminded me of like Elliot Roger type stuff. Just really misogynistic and entitled. And I just think that Josh has like a history of having a really messed up idea of love and where his affections can be placed. Like he doesn't know, he doesn't get that it's not okay to jump from sister to sister. He doesn't get that it's not okay to even probably think about a 12 year old. It's not okay to have pornographic images of Disney stars on your computer when you're supposed to be raising two boys. You know, that's part of why he lost custody of them. So it like, it's generational it goes back like a lot of it stems from what josh's father did to him and you know he crossed boundaries with josh as a kid and so josh never had like a full well-rounded example of like what's okay and what's not okay and so i'm not like excusing josh or anything but it just goes to show that like generational trauma and being abused it, it's a ripple effect and it's a cycle that needs to be broken whatever kind of abuse it's it's present and prevalent in our society and like this is the outcome you know this is what happens when it goes untreated unaddressed and you know terry tried to address it she tried to address it in the divorce she tried to help steer her kids in the right direction and she never gave up on them it, it takes more than one person to be able to like recognize these things and like try to put a stop to them so as josh is getting older and he's not having much luck in his love life he does start moving forward, you know, and looking towards the future. He enrolls in college, and he actually gets more involved in the Mormon church again, you know. His mom really encourages him to seek therapy, but like to ultimately turn to the church for guidance because um, Josh has like a really complicated relationship with his father, you know. He thinks his father resents him. He thinks that his father, like, offers him help, you know, when it's convenient, just so that he can um, use it against Josh later on. It's just like a very conditional, like I said, conditional relationship. Um, and Terry is like, you know what, you know who offers unconditional love? God and the church. You should turn to that because, you know, 
that's just like what Josh is longing for. And he gets that for a while in the church, you know, he's um, going to youth groups and meeting people like on college campus and stuff. And not all of it was like um, based in the Mormon religion, like some of it was like born again Christians and stuff like that. But he was turning back to his faith and he wrote a lot in his t like diaries in college, you know, about how he needed space from his dad and his dad perceives things to be true because he wants them to be true. So he, he kind of gets some clarity about his father when he has space from his father, which I think is super relatable. I mean, I think when you are really like up close to something, it's hard to get a clear picture about what the full thing is, you know, but when you back away, take a couple steps back, it is easier to make out the big picture. And he was starting to realize, you know, that Steve is kind of, um, manipulative and abusive emotionally like he tears him down and doesn't really offer him resources to stand on his own or be like a strong man so he does turn to the church and and um, this is actually where he met one of his like first serious girlfriends uh, her name was Catherine and Catherine was living in Washington with her aunt and uncle when she met Josh and she was a member of the LDS faith as well and um, they met like as she was coming off of a pretty serious relationship, so she was kind of vulnerable and she describes herself like when she met Josh as like very starry-eyed and innocent and a bit naive and that she was like very into Josh. Um, and so they had started dating and you know he was 22, she was 19 and they moved in together right away. But the, where they moved in together was like a really small cramped apartment that just was leaky and it just was not um, a really great atmosphere, especially for two young people. And um, like during this time, both Catherine and Josh were going to college and they didn't have a lot of money because they didn't really have, you know, secure high paying jobs. But Josh was spending a lot of money and this is a pattern that he would continue on throughout his life, but like really started here. It's like he discovered credit cards and would overspend. You know, he, t he wrote in one of his journals one time about how he went to go buy something and was surprised when his credit card was declined and that he didn't have any cash in his wallet he didn't have any access to any money at all so that really just goes to show that he was like spending and living way beyond his means and also not really keeping track of it um, but you know when he didn't have any money he would just spend Catherine's and it's it, this is where he really started to exert control over her was like with their money and he did this with Susan too um, but he would like take Catherine's paychecks and um, they, he would deposit them into an account that she didn't have access to and even Catherine's student loans he had her sign the loans over to him and she never saw that money ever and she's still paying those debts so Josh was just very controlling over finances um, somehow he is able to like get these women to trust him on that level which I mean I get it's easy like when you're in love with somebody you want to trust them and you know the thought of being able to like blend your lives together and finances being one aspect of that you know it's exciting and you you hope for the best but unfortunately in Catherine's case and in Susan's case and anybody who comes into contact with Josh Powell it's it's not a good thing and Josh ranked up like a lot of debt and so they're living in this crummy apartment like with them not having a lot of money either they didn't have access to transportation Josh had a crappy little motorcycle but Catherine couldn't drive this so she was dependent on Josh for money and transportation and um, in the house they only had like a phone and um, a tiny computer and Josh would be really controlling over these things and he wouldn't just like let her use them as she desired but like he would monitor her usage and he would read her journals too which is such an invasion of privacy and just goes to show the, again the need for control that he has you know he couldn't even let her have her own private thoughts and this was something that he did to Susan as well. Like Susan, um, he didn't just read Susan's journals, but he would make her edit people out of her journals. Like she would write stuff about her old boyfriends, you know, because that's stuff that was happening at the time when she was in high school. And then Josh would make her like edit out those pages, like tear them out, tear them out. So it's just, he's really controlling and the control that he needs to exert over 
people's own you know personal diaries and personal thoughts is unhealthy and it's a red flag so if anybody's ever doing that to you or like trying to you know sneak a peek at your laptop or your phone or your stuff like that and like constantly demanding that they have access to these things it's not just a trust issue it, it really is something deeper than that it's like especially in Josh Powell's case it's like a method of control and oftentimes like that type of thing escalates so you know if it's starting with that and needing constant access to like who you're communicating with and knowing what you're thinking and writing about and then it leads to you know control over finances and transportation and soon Catherine you know talked about how she found herself like being really isolated from her friends and her family because she couldn't visit them or talk to them you know and and so she really felt like she needed some type of like social interaction so she wanted her and Josh to join like an LDS congregation and they ended up joining one but they joined one for married couples this just really further isolated her because they joined like under a lie you know and um, she talks about in like the cold podcast Catherine gives an interview and she talks about how Josh had her wear like a fake wedding band you know to like kind of keep up their little charade and it made Catherine feel really uncomfortable like as I'm sure like nobody would feel comfortable like lying especially like in your religion you know um, when it's that important to you like it obviously Josh didn't have the same values as she did and you know she wanted this to be a, a chance for her to like make some friends but like anytime she got close to anybody Josh would just insert himself and like try to block that so it's again him trying to control who she interacts with um, how she interacts and it's just it's unhealthy and it, it once that kind of stuff starts happening in a relationship, it's time to get out. And luckily, that's exactly what Catherine did. So she cut lucky enough to go back home and visit um, some family and friends in Utah for a while. And having some distance, you know, from Josh, like, gave her some perspective. Just like when Josh needed some distance from his dad and he got some clarity, it's like... He, Catherine realized like how isolated she was once she finally got a taste of freedom She realized how abnormal that relationship was and how unhealthy it was and she did not want to go back to it So she broke up with Josh over the phone like good for her She seriously dodged a bullet and it's just so sad to see that like a lot of the stuff that he did to Catherine um, Happened in his and Susan's relationship too, and then it just escalated, you know um Earlier I mentioned, you know, one of the dysfunctional parts of Josh and Susan's marriage was that they had an issue with physical intimacy. Like Susan didn't feel like Josh gave her enough attention in that way. He would say that he was like afraid he was going to get sick if he kissed her or was too close to her in any way. Like yet he's she's the mother of his children, so I don't know why that would be a problem, but Catherine talked in her interview um, with Dave Colley on the Cold Podcast about how Josh had the same, you know, fears um, of getting sick, like from intimacy with Catherine. So there was a lot of similarities and a lot of behavioral patterns that Josh displayed in relationships. And I feel like, you know, if people knew about these things, um, like if Susan had known about this stuff, I don't, I don't think she would have been into Josh as strongly as she was in the first place, you know? And obviously it's not Catherine's fault, but she's just lucky to have made it out of that relationship too. I'm sure that she needed space and she needed time to like heal and even really like process exactly what happened, you know? Because when you're in it, you don't always have a clear perspective, you know? Like we talked about that. You don't always have a clear perspective of what you're in until like you get some space from it. And so, I've been through trauma before too and like I've just needed, you know, sometimes you just need to like put it out of your mind for a while until you're able to deal with it. And so I'm sure that's what Catherine needed to do and I'm sure she was shocked when she found out everything that happened and probably never thought that she would cross paths with him again. The, the type of abuse that Josh inflicted on her and like that control is really scary and confusing I think to people who are in it because it's not like he was like hitting her, you know, or doing, you know, things that were like giving her a black eye, stuff that is like kind of like textbook that you would expect from an abusive, unhealthy 
red flag relationship, you know? Um, he, but he was doing things that were like not okay, like crossing boundaries and exerting control and isolating her. Um, and that that's not okay either, you know? And, and it might not be the same as like giving somebody a black eye, but it's still unhealthy and it could still lead to like even more things down the road because like clearly Josh had some um, you know, mental stuff that he wasn't dealing with and stuff that was going on with him. And I don't think he really, I don't think he sought like therapy after, you know, his adolescence. So maybe if he had though, he would have like tried to find ways to cope with some of the reasons why he needed this control. Like that's part of why I am super interested in forensic psychology and this aspect of these cases is because like he, you, you know, like what was going on in Josh's mind when this was happening because there's probably a reason for him that he needed to exert that control to feel safe in that relationship like he didn't just do this to one girl he made a pattern of it so why would somebody do that probably because he didn't feel stable like he he was worried of losing control of the relationship he wanted to have control you know to make sure that they stayed and that he wasn't abandoned and left feeling alone. Given his father and his childhood and stuff like that, he didn't really have a good role model of like how to build healthy relationships. And that just is so obvious in his adult life and the way he conducted himself in his dating life, you know? Um, and people like that, I they deserve help still because they can be dangerous. I mean, look at what happened with Josh. It escalated so much. Susan talked about in her journals how like he would just have like such tense and um, you know amplified energy that was like frightening, and he would like get all up like close to her, but like not do anything or say anything, just like trying to intimidate her. And if she would back away or say like I'm gonna call the police he would be like, oh, well, I'm, I'm not doing anything. Like, I, you're the crazy one. I'm just literally standing here. And it's like those mind games and those like weird, like um, assert, assertions of like aggression that I think are just as dangerous in a way as like some forms of physical abuse. I'm sure Susan was a little bit afraid of the escalation that would happen with them and obviously it escalated to like the worst possible scenario. All right, but I am losing sunlight so that's where I am going to leave this video for today but I will be making a part two that's like a continuation um, talking a little bit more about Susan and everything that happened. Some of the stuff that happened with Steve Powell later on like when Susan and Josh were living with him and even after that so I will be going into more detail in part two so stick around and I'll talk to you then.